Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck, and a very warm welcome to Friday Frightworks. And this week, we're going to be taking a look at my last poll and some changes I'm going to be making. <laughs> something I've spoken about quite a lot recently actually but for those of you who don't know me in the last few years I've been very fortunate to spend a good amount of time with some truly incredible holy grail level Les Pauls early to mid to late 50s gold tops and of course quite a few bursts now we'll leave their price out of the equation for the time being but in all honesty having a chance to play these guitars has been a total education in not only what a Les Paul can sound like but in all reality what it probably should sound like and this is precisely what I was speaking about on a recent feature I shot for Guitarist magazine. Um, I guess, like I said, that sort of kind of ballsiness, I guess, that you do associate with a Les Paul, but at the same time having that clarity and that just articulation or articulateness, if that's a word, um, around the individual notes and chords and just being able to play a chord and still hear everything kind of sort of ringing out and blooming beautifully. Um, which, like I said, for a, for a long time wasn't something I was particularly accustomed to. And then you hear these in isolation and in a, in a band context and everything. I guess the the kind of case in point being the Blues Breakers record was a massive one for me when I was a kid, stepping out in particular. Um, and just listening to that and thinking, right, that's, that's a kind of... A bridge pickup on a Les Paul, and then suddenly having experience, it's kind of like, oh, maybe that was actually the neck pickup, you know? Suddenly there's that warmth and there's that kind of, you get that bite, but you get that sort of ballsiness to it as well. And you think, right, that might have actually been the neck pickup, and it's totally just transformed my expectation of what a Les Paul sounds like. <laughs> Having access to such guitars for magazine features is one thing and is great, but having access to guitars that you feel can approximate that tone or that magic on a daily basis without spending upwards of a quarter to even half a million pounds or dollars is another thing entirely. Now, I recently bought a 1980 Greco Super Reel, a Japanese made Les Paul replica that have fantastic reputations and, in all honesty, been absolutely blown away by it. Aside from ticking a lot of the boxes in what I kind of want in my mind's eye from the perfect burst, it's also just a fantastic sounding guitar. However, having had a chance at that magazine feature shoot, just to put it side by side with a few originals, it's kind of left me thinking there may well be some room for improvement. So this is going to be the first in a new series where I switch out a couple of parts and try and get a little bit closer to that magic kind of holy grail burst tone that I clearly have fixated on in recent years. And in this episode, it's going to be probably the most drastic change you can make to a guitar's tone. Pickups. 
Now, before we delve into pickup talk, one thing that's definitely worth mentioning is that last year I shot a video taking a look at a fairly small, albeit pretty drastic change that you can make to your Les Paul for a very small amount of money, but will have a massive effect on its tone. And that is, of course, the pots or potentiometers. One thing that's definitely worth knowing about those early to mid to late 50s Les Pauls is that they use 500k pots at the bare minimum. And what this essentially means is that they don't allow treble frequencies to be diverted to ground quite so easily as say the 300k pots which came in my 2001 Les Paul standard which by the time I took them out of that guitar were actually reading closer to 250. For reference that's what you get in a Stratocaster. Single coils in a Strat obviously being infinitely brighter pickups than you would get in a Les Paul so it made a lot of sense as to why I'd always struggle with that guitar sounding quite so dark. Now the reason I'm not going to do this in this Greco is I've recently done it. I changed out the original pots which were rated at 500k but but were a little bit scratchy and also presented some issues in being able to change the knobs. Basically, the stems were a slightly different shape to what I was looking to put on there. Changed them out for some bare knuckle 550k pots. Pretty much a like for like change. But as I said, it's facilitated getting some new, more period correct knobs on there, as well as just making the guitar a little bit more usable in a live context. <laughs> One frustration with these old Japanese made replicas is that they use metric measurements as opposed to imperial which can make like for like swaps a little bit difficult. That said, since I made the last video on this guitar a few months ago when I got it, I've changed out the truss rod cover, the pick guard and the pickup rings for some from Dead Mint Club, just all in aid of it looking infinitely more realistic to an original burst. So the pickups that came in this guitar were a little bit of a mix and match, which to be honest is one of the reasons that I wanted to experiment with changing them. In the neck position we had one of the guitar's original Dry Z pickups, a fabled Dry Z I should proceed that with, basically an early attempt at recreating that PAF magic manufactured by Maxon in the late 1970s and very early 1980s. And in the bridge position I had a PAF replica made by Wiz. Out of the two I think I marginally preferred or found the Wiz to be marginally more accurate to what I have heard in those original PAFs, which I guess is interesting given the insane prices that a set of dry Z's will set you back today. But to be honest, the two pickups kind of felt like they were more in competition than they were complementary to each other. So at the very least, I wanted to try a set of match PAF replicas to see how I got on. Now the first set that I'm going to try in this guitar, in this video, is made by Throwback, very kindly loaned to me by Zach at Mythos Pedals, who was singing their praises recently. A throwback, of course, being renowned for using the very same machinery that Gibson used to wind these pickups back in the mid 50s. So after recording a few reference clips with the Dry Z and with the Wiz, then switched them out for the throwbacks to see if there was any difference at all. This is the results. <laughs>
So I guess the first thing I should say is that the improvements were arguably more subtle than I was expecting, to be honest, which I guess is testament not only to the fact that any improvements made to this guitar going forward are going to be more incremental than anything else, but also the fact that the two pickups that were in this guitar were both of a high standard in and of themselves. However, the one thing that I've definitely noticed with the throwbacks, and maybe the only thing to be honest, is that the guitar, to my ear at least, sounds infinitely more woody. I guess I'm hearing more of the guitar's natural character and its natural kind of tonality shining through, both back through the amp in the room and listening back on headphones to the recording. Whether that's something that I'm kind of perceiving that isn't necessarily there or isn't necessarily there to the extent that I'm perceiving it to be there, I guess it's down to you guys to decide. But for me at least that's the first and kind of only thing I noticed. That kind of woodiness and 3D texture is definitely something that I've really latched onto in a few of those original bursts that I've played. It's a real characteristic of those that I kind of love. So it's exciting to hear that in this guitar. And despite being a very subtle improvement, I guess it is still an improvement nonetheless. So there's a few other things that I want to change with this guitar over time. Firstly, the tuners, they feel a little bit loose in places and I'm not entirely sure that the guitar's stability is being helped by them. But aside from that, in terms of kind of major tonal changes, the next thing that I really want to experiment with is changing the bridge and the tailpiece, which having spent a lot of time with people who know infinitely more about this stuff than I do, namely Ed and Hugh from the Tone Twins TV on YouTube. I'll link to their channel down below. They're a wealth of knowledge and experience, especially when it comes to these types of guitars. Both of those guys swear blind that the tailpiece and the bridge is a huge factor in the tone of those guitars that I'm so kind of avidly chasing. However, the difficulty, of course, with these original Grecos or any kind of Japanese replicas is, as I said, using metric measurements as opposed to Imperial. It's not just a case of ordering stuff and switching it in and out. I'm going to have to spend a little bit of time trying to find ones that I know in advance actually fit the guitar, otherwise it's going to be a bit of a fruitless task. I guess this was a slightly self-indulgent video, so apologies if this is not your thing, but hopefully this will help some of you in the right direction in regard to which kind of features it is of these guitars that are so important to that magical tone which they, at least for me, undeniably have. As ever, I'm Chris Buck. Thank you very much for watching. As I said, this is going to be an ongoing kind of sporadic series, so keep your eyes peeled if you are interested in this kind of thing. As ever, please subscribe, hit the bell icon if you haven't already, and I shall see you next week for another episode. Cheers guys, take care, I'll see you soon. Thank you.